Um, we are in a series um, called Hope and Holiness. So we're going to uh, First Peter. And so First Peter, Peter wrote a letter to Christians who were dispersed in an area um, known as Asia Minor and under the Roman Empire authority. And so they were um, persecuted Christians that Peter is writing to. And so we've been walking through this. We're in First Peter. We're starting chapter three today. Um, this is, I don't know how well you guys can see this, but any, anybody in here puzzle, puzzle people? They like to do puzzles, right? All right, we got a few, yay. All right, some puzzle people. Um, my mother, this is a puzzle that my mother put together and, and she gave me. And I remember as a kid, like my mom, my aunt, I especially remember my uh, Aunt Linda was a big, big puzzle person. And I don't remember, like, I don't know, I don't know how many pieces of puzzles were in the puzzles that she did but I can remember like especially my Aunt Linda's house when you'd walk into her kitchen and her kitchen table was sitting there and that was not for meals that was for puzzles and so puzzles would always be there and I don't know I, I always have this vision in my head when I think about it what I see is the outline of the puzzle right she took all the edge pieces and put them together first and then there's this big open spot where there's nothing and then off to the side there's just this pile of pieces like what what is this like you can't even tell it's all these different pieces that are different shapes and colors and got different designs on it and like what is this and of course she would have the box um lid propped up next to it so oh that's what it's supposed to look like it, it didn't look like that at all when it was in a pile it was just a pile of pieces, but it was intended to be this puzzle. And so as we talk today, as we continue through our letter of 1 Peter, um, we're going to talk about unity this morning, living in unity. And I think um, that's a challenge, Like, but we are called as Christians to live in unity. And so we're going to look at that in a couple different perspectives, husbands and wives living in unity, but also as a church family living in unity. And I, I think of a puzzle. Um, that puzzle at one point was in a box, and it didn't look anything like what it looks now, um, but it was it was placed, all the pieces, unique individual pieces were placed where they were supposed to go in order to make it turn out to be the piece that it is. So we are going to be in um, 1 Peter chapter 3, and um, we talked last week about hard texts and the, the Bible, the Word of God being the truth, uh, absolute truth, and, and when we turn to it, and sometimes there's things that we read that are hard texts for us, and, and we do have to wrestle with those, and I think that's good for us to wrestle with those understanding, though, that God's Word is, is truth, and I think so today, um, for some people, today's text is going to be one of those hard texts truths. And so we'll walk through this a little bit, wrestle with this a little bit together. And ultimately, I think what we need to focus on, and we talked about this last week in, that, in, in trusting God to actually walk it out, trusting God that, okay, all of these pieces are pieces of a puzzle that we don't fully see put together yet, but, but God does. He has a plan and a purpose for all of this, and we just need to have faith and, and trust in that as we follow Jesus. And so let's jump into First Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 1. We'll go 1 through 12 this morning. Verse 1 says, Wives, in the same way, submit yourself to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. And so first, I, I want to touch base. We're, we're going to talk about wives. We're going to talk about husbands. Um, but I think this... This letter from Peter, this what the way he speaks to wives, thinking in the cultural context of this society at this time, um, these are some pretty radical things that Peter is about to go through and, and explain and, and look at husbands and wives. And so we'll talk about both of them. I also think it's important, too, as we talk about submission, submission seems like a really hard word and a hard thing to do. And I think of Ephesians 5.21, as a husband and wife, we are both called to submit to each other in reverence of God. 
And so there's submitting done on both sides. Submission means we talked last week about placing ourselves under one's authority is to submit. I, I read this um, definition and I, and I really like it. Submission is to voluntarily yield your rights or will to someone else's wishes or advice as an expression of love for that person. And so in its submission, we submit ourselves out of love. Um, and so I do want to point out, it says in the same way, that's how we started. And so we want to look back in the same way as what? So going back to, to the end of chapter two, you guys might remember as we talked about submission in chapter two, we talked about, you know, what it looks like to submit to authority, um, submit to the president, submit to the governor, submit to the police officer sitting out here on the highway. Um, but we also talked about submitting to one another. And, and we finished um, 1 Peter 2, 21, it, it called to submit and remembering that Christ suffered for you. Verse uh, 221, 1 Peter 2, 21, Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And so I think what Peter is saying, he's pointing back in, in the same way, as, as Christ suffered, as Christ um, humbled himself to serve others, you too should humble yourself in submission to your own husband so that, um, all right, good, so there's a reason why, why we do this, so that if they don't believe the word, they may be won over without words. And so if they're not a believer, if they're not a, a, a follower of Jesus, that your lifestyle, the way you live out your life, will win them to Jesus. It's interesting, and so I think about this, and obviously in this situation, some of these wives and some of these situations would have come to trust Jesus on their own, and it's a really a patriarchal society in which in a lot of cases, the husband, whatever religion he was, that's what the wife was. And so Peter's saying, look, look, if you live your life in a way following Christ, your husband's going to recognize that. And he's going to come to know Christ through the example that you set. Not, not by words, not by you telling him that he needs to follow Jesus, he needs to get right, he needs to whatever. Um, not that way, but, but by seeing you. We, as a youth pastor and, and talking to, to youth leaders and talking to parents about their children, I tell a lot of times, I tell them, like, way more is caught than is taught. Like, they see your actions, they see your life, they see the way you live, and that really hits home more than what you say. So if you say it but don't live it, it doesn't really make a difference. But if you live it and say it, they see you living it, and that makes a difference. And I want to add, Peter. Peter's saying that, you know, if if they don't believe the word. But I, I will also say, even if they do, it draws them closer to Jesus. I, I, I can speak from my perspective, my, my wife, Dina, like watching her live out her faith. I, I've been asked, I remember we went on a youth group trip um, last year and, and there was a picture taken, or two years ago, there was a picture taken at the beginning of the trip of us together. And then at the end of the trip on the way back, they took a picture of, we were together and we were, talking and I don't remember anyway and they posted it on social media it's like second day going pretty good y'all um something like that I don't remember anyway but but I remember through that through that that trip that we were on with our youth group students just watching my wife be obedient to God um in lots of different ways you know early morning quiet time with God like watching her serve others like pour out into others. Honestly, sometimes having conversations with her about how that didn't work out the way she thought and, and maybe she was hurt through that, but she's trusting God. Honestly, following me five and a half hours away to come to a, a place where we don't really know anybody. We didn't really know anything, but we felt like God was calling us and she was obedient. She was faithful and that helps me want to be a better, a better husband, a better, a better father, a better man of Christ, because I see her living out her faith. And, and so I think that's absolutely the case here. Like the whole point, like Peter has made this point before, like 
Why is this? So that people will know Jesus. So that your husbands will know Jesus. Going on in verse 3, it says, Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self. Self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. So I want to be clear. Like, this isn't saying, hey, don't do your hair. Don't wear nice clothes or whatever. That's, that's not what Peter's saying. Um, he's saying that isn't, that isn't your real beauty. Don't, don't make that who you are. You aren't beautiful because your hair looks nice or you have nice clothes. You're beautiful because of what's inside of you. And, and let that, that come out. And, and I think about that as I think about, about my wife and I think about the things that I, I love and watching her serve and seeing Jesus work through her. That's beautiful. That's attractive. That's the kind of beauty that Peter is talking about, the inner beauty that doesn't fade away. Like the hairdos and the fancy clothes are all going to fade away, but that inner beauty never will. I, I like how the ESV puts this. Um, it says, let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which in God's sight is very precious. The hidden person of the heart, that inside, that deep down, who you really are, who God created you to be, working through you, let that be your beauty, which is, is precious in the sight of God. And so I know as we, as we read through these things and, and some of these words, a gentle and quiet spirit, like that sounds kind of meek and I, I, I want to think of the opposite of these two words first of all the opposite of, of gentle if you're not gentle mean antagonistic unkind I think, I, I think about those words don't don't be those things be be gentle quiet the opposite of quiet would be loud brash abrasive I think the picture that that Peter is trying to make and, and the picture that uh, of a woman that is these things is a woman who has strength of character, a, a woman who has strong self-control. Man, I, my wife being my wife, sometimes I'm sure I just absolutely drive her crazy and she would like to do some things maybe. I don't know, but she has strong self-control. Um, and then finally, I think it, there is this, it's just a quiet elegance and, and dignity. You know, that's the type of, of woman that God has made you to be. And, and the beauty of you are those things inside you that God has created, God in you. And it's revealed with how you live, how you are obedient to Christ. Verse five says, for this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands like Sarah who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. And so we, we are talking about wives and we're talking about husbands here in a second. Um, and I know there are some in this room that don't fit those categories. Maybe you're, you're young and, and you're not married, but you might intend to be someday. I, I would encourage you to listen because this is, is for you. Uh, there was so much I wish I knew before I got married that I learned and I'm learning as I'm married um, would be super helpful to know in advance. But I also want to say this, if maybe you're in a position where, you know, marriage is not in your future. You don't see that. That's, that's probably not something that's going to happen, whether it's your life stage or whatever it might be. I think this right here is a good reason for you to listen to because, because God, God uses, or Peter uses an example here of the holy women in the past, looking at, at past scripture and looking at the holy women and how they lived their life and how they adorned their faith, not elaborate things. And I think I know there are women in, in this church that, that fit that, that are, are quiet and gentle spirits walking out their faith. And I, I want to encourage you as young women um, to seek those people in your life for wisdom and guidance. And so then I also want to encourage you, if you are, are on the other side of that, if you've kind of been walking through this and you've got some experience and some faith, 
to to then reach out and use that to to young wives around you, especially if you've been through the fire that they are currently going through. And so I think this is is good for for everyone to to have some part in this. And so Peter uses Sarah as a an example here. Um, Sarah respected Abraham, called him Lord, sir, uh, was very respectful, but Sarah also followed him. Um, she was obedient, and, and I think she lived in a submission in a way that she listened to his desires, his needs, and she was then supportive and, and helpful in that and following him. And it says, you are her children if you do what is right. Sometimes I think we're challenged by what is right put our faith in God, trust God, follow Jesus. And if we're doing that consistently, we're doing what is right. And this is do not give way to fear. And I think, I think it's really important here that this submission that Peter is telling wives to, to put themselves in to their husbands should never be out of fear. It, it should never be out of intimidation. It should be out of love. Verse 7 says, husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder, will hinder your prayers. Again, in, in the same way, Peter's saying the same thing as what he said to the wives, in the same way. I think we're going back to, to looking at, at Christ where he, he humbled himself and he offered himself as a sacrifice for others, it's, it's calling husbands to do the same thing. Be considerate as you live with. This is, is the word gnosis. It, it's have this intimate knowledge, intimate meaning. Like I know my wife's thoughts. I know her wants. I know everything about her. It's a, it's a, a complete understanding of who she is. And so I, I thought about this and it's weird because um, as a guy, like trying to figure out women is sometimes challenging like, but the good news is, I think I only have to really figure out three of them. My, my wife, first and foremost, and, and my daughters, Allie and Lauren. Like, I have to try to figure out them. And then the rest, I'm not going to worry about. Like, I'm just going to focus on, on them. But in this, like, knowing them, understanding them, it, it is this deep, intimate knowledge of who they are. And I, as a guy, like, hobbies, you know, I, I like, you know, whatever it is. You, you may have a hobby that you like hunting, fishing, um, golfing, uh, whatever it is, frisbee golf, uh, whatever it is that you might have these things. Like I, I kind of have, I wouldn't call it a hobby, but um, doing, you know, work around the house, honeydew list is a thing that I have to get on YouTube and I'm YouTubing how to do all of these things and I'm learning how to do this. And it, it's, it's, I'm understanding, I'm gaining knowledge of it. And I think whether it's like golf, if I want to become a better golfer, what do I do? I get on YouTube. Everything is on YouTube, right? So if you want to get better, you get on YouTube. I, I think as husbands, like Peter said, look, you need to not YouTube your wife, but you need to in the same way, learn everything you can about her, right? You want to find out, all right, what makes her tick? What makes her happy? What are her desires? How can I do that? And that's what he's calling us to do that with respect, with knowledge, with understanding, with appreciation, not using our authority, um, not using, when he says weaker partner, like that totally means physically. Peter is completely talking about, like in general, women are physically weaker than men. That's just, it's the way it is. I, I looked up a couple of things. Um, the, uh, this is interesting to me. It was interesting. There are over 1,500 guys, males, who have ran a sub four minute mile in, in the history of the world and, and not a single female. There's like 100, I think it was 127, roughly 130 high school boys have ran a sub four minute mile, but a female has never done it. Now, I looked up the bench press. The bench press record blew my mind. I had no idea people could lift this much. The male men's record for bench press is, it's in kilograms, but it's roughly 1,400 pounds. That's insane. The female record is half that. It's about 700 pounds. Like just physically, men are, are stronger. That's the way we were created. Don't use that against your wife. 
don't abuse what God has given you to disrespect or to harm or to hurt your wife. This is, she is also an heir, an equal partner in, in the gift of life and what Jesus died for to give us, that we are equal partners together in life. And I think this is really important, guys. Um, and so that because why, why do we want to do these things? Why do we want to treat our wife well? So that nothing will hinder your prayers. I think about that. And, and there's, there's some debate among theologians as to what exactly Peter is trying to say here. Like, is he saying, I think either way, is he saying that if you treat your wife poorly, God won't listen to you? And, and I think about this. Like, if, if, you're, if you're dating the king's daughter and you treat her poorly, do you have any right to go to the king and expect him to listen to you when you want or need something? No. No, but also I think what, what, what Peter might be saying, and, and I think it might be both, is that if we're going to treat our wife poorly, like, what does that say about our, our, our spiritual health? What does that say about our relationship with Jesus? If we have a poor relationship with our wife, like, we might be unfit. We might be unwilling. We might be unable to pray because we don't have a desire for it or a sincerity for it. And so I, I as I think about this, it's, it's kind of, I don't know, it makes me really want to take note and really think like, okay, the way I treat my wife impacts or impacted by my spiritual health, it affects or is affected by my spiritual health. If, if I can't be right with my wife, can I be right with God? That's a hard question. And I think about things that I've prayed for and, you know, and, and, and God, God answers things in his timing and his way. Um, but has there been times in my life where my prayer life has been affected by my treatment of my wife? Verse 8 says, finally, I think it's funny that Peter puts finally right here because we're like in the middle. We're not at the end. Um, so finally, this guy's preaching. Finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. And so we remember that that Peter is He's talking to Christians. He's writing this to Christians. So he's saying this, you Christians, be like-minded. Live in harmony. Live in such a way that, that division in the church seems impossible. Like, how do we do that? Because we're different. We're all little different pieces of this puzzle. And, and, and it's not necessarily about our differences. It's how we handle our differences and how we use our differences to build each other up. There are some of you have skills and abilities and things that I do not have. And, and you can do things that I can't do. And, and we need each other to be built into who God is calling us, his church, his kingdom. So be like-minded, be sympathetic. This means like the same pain. It, it, it's not just feeling that same pain, but it's it's reacting, it's responding to that same pain. It's I understand your hurt. Maybe I've been there before, and I want to help you. I, I want to sit with you in this. Love one another. We are called to love our Christian brothers and sisters. Um, Peter is pointing back. He he said this again in. in um, Chapter 1, verse 22, now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. So call it to love deeply from the heart, compassionate, to have a tender heart is to be compassionate. And I, I think about this. Uh, so Friday, I dislocated my left pointer finger. Um, it's very tender. Uh, if I bump it on my Bible or touch it or whatever, I notice it. it. It hurts. I feel it. And, and I think in, in compassionate, what this word means is to have a heart 
that feels for others. When they get bumped, you feel it. And it, 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 it prompts you to respond and, and to help them. And then finally, be humble. I think that's humility is, is actually, he says it last, I think it's the first step. If we can't walk in humility, we're, we're going to have challenges. And I think being humble is really hard um, because pride just consumes us in so many different ways. Um, maybe we don't want to accept help. Maybe we're too proud to accept help. Maybe we give help, but we have this little bit of superiority complex as we as we do. And, and so humility, I, I heard it said, and maybe you've heard, humility is not thinking less of oneself. It's thinking of oneself less. Humility is an awareness of our strengths, our gifts, and a gratitude that we have been given them from God. Humility is also an awareness of our weaknesses and our needs and a desire to be, to grow in those weaknesses and needs and a willingness to receive help and assistance in those weaknesses and needs. And it's an attitude that's content to work in the background. It doesn't need the spotlight to put others ahead of your self-interest. That's all humility and we do this we're we're called to this as christians then we love each other we live with each other we serve together with each other we become the church uh, verse 9 says do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult on the contrary repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing so what peter is saying that when somebody does something bad to you when they do something not very kind to you don't respond in kind Respond with kindness. Don't, don't treat them the way they treat you. Speak life. Speak encouragement. Speak well. Bless them. And, and when you bless them, it, it's crazy. So this isn't like a, a karma thing. If you do this, this will happen. Or It's, it's nothing like that. In general, if I, if I bless people, if I speak kindly to you, you're, you're in general going to speak kindly to me. I'm going to receive a blessing back. And, and, and as I bless you, right, that's one positive reason to do this because you're blessed. If, if I receive a blessing back from you, that's a second reason. But ultimately, God is honored as we bless each other. He, he, told, he told Abraham, look, I, I will bless you to be a blessing. I'm going to bless you. Go bless others. And, and, and so that's what Peter is talking about here. Um, to bless others in kindness. We're almost done, I promise. Maybe. Finally. Come on. Uh, all right. Um, in 10 through 12, Peter's quoting from Psalm 34, uh, verses 12 through 16. David, King David, this is before he was king, wrote, uh, wrote Psalm 34. And, and here's what it says. Uh, for whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So David wrote these words originally in Psalm 34. Um, he is... Uh, this happened in, in 1 Samuel 21. You can read the events that happened. So he's before King uh, Abimelech, and, and he's, he's acting insane to, to get away. And so he writes these words, and I think it's really interesting because what happens next for David? David is being pursued by Saul. Like Saul wants to kill him. Saul is the king at the time. Saul wants to kill David. And so he's pursuing him. He's hunting him. He's tracking him down. And, and that's his goal. And so David and his men are hiding in this cave at one point. Like they're, they're hiding from Saul in this case. And Saul comes in to relieve him. And, and David's men are like, this is your chance. This is, God has delivered your enemy to your hands. Like take him out, take him down, kill him. Let's go. And, and David doesn't. Instead, he, he sneaks up behind him and he cuts off a piece of his robe. He doesn't take revenge. He could have killed Saul easily. But then he does this in, in 1 Samuel 24, 8, it says, Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, who's, who's walking away, My Lord, the king, 
When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. Like David lived out these words that he said. He didn't take revenge. He had every opportunity to, regardless of what Saul was saying about him, how Saul was treating him, he, he sought peace and, and he pursued it. And so I think what's really, if we look at this, like we are, we seek peace, we pursue peace, we seek Jesus, we pursue Jesus. As we do that, like we are more likely, this is not really a promise, but we are just typically more likely to live a long life and to enjoy our life if we're doing good. If we're not saying evil, deceitful things constantly, we're, we're likely to more enjoy life, to love life, and to live a long life. Peter said in um, chapter 2, 1, he said, Therefore rid yourself of all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. These are the same types of words, like don't, don't, use deceitful speech don't don't use words that twist information or that are designed to tear down other people don't talk that way evil and insulting words like they can give us this temporary i feel good but ultimately they destroy relationships and they destroy our testimony and our witness for jesus and so peter says turn from evil and do good repent and turn to Jesus. Seek peace and pursue it. Seek and follow. This is a picture of what it looks like to repent and to follow Jesus. So our good deeds, the things that we do, they are just good deeds. They're good deeds in themselves, but they have a purpose beyond good deeds. Like our goal should not be to, I just want to do good. I just want to do good. Our, our goal should be to glorify God and reflect Jesus. We are righteous in God's eyes only because of Jesus, because he lives in us. When, when God looks at us, he sees Jesus. And I think what, when other people look to us, who do they see? I hope they see Jesus. As Christ followers, we should receive insults and evil, and we should not retaliate. When we receive insults and evil, we should not retaliate, but we should repay with a blessing. How do we do that? Pray. Pray for them. Pray for those people who insult you. Treat them kindly, even with sympathy, not understanding where they came from or what's going on in their life. And, and here's, the, here's, here's forgive. Forgive them. To forgive, you may have heard, to forgive is to set a prisoner free, and that prisoner is you. Even if they've hurt you deeply, forgive. Peter didn't always live this out, right? He, he messed it up plenty of times. He... Um, in the garden, he's defending Jesus. He cuts off Malchus's ear, right? It's not good. He denies Jesus three times, including to a servant girl and to one of Malchus's um, relatives. Like Peter didn't always live it out well, but Peter grew. And just a few years from writing this letter, Peter would die claiming Christ is risen. And so we're called as Christian to, to humble ourselves, to submit to God's plan, but it has to be Jesus. It has to be Jesus in us. And as, as husbands and wives, as a church, and we're all individual unique pieces, but when we're put together, whether it's our family, or whether it's our church, it, it's gotta make a beautiful picture that reflects Jesus. That's who we're called to be. He's building us into that kingdom, that church. Let's pray. Ah, Lord, um, just want to thank you again, um, God, for for I don't know your your word and and going through this. God, I, I pray. I, I thank you for um, the convictions that you've laid on my heart um, in this and in ways that I respond, in ways that I react and retaliate, uh, ways that I treat other people. And so, Lord, I just I just pray that you would. Um, if I'm not the only one that may be feeling some conviction that you would help guide our, our hearts to, um, to pursue peace and to seek peace and, and help us to do that, especially with, with anybody that we may have hurt um, and, and help us to forgive those who have hurt us. So we love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 